It's time for the Kim Hammer Show, where you'll learn how your state government affects you, your family, and community. Here's Kim Hammer. Good Saturday afternoon. Hope you're having a great day and that you're enjoying. And you got to be careful out here in the heat that's today. I mean, we're in a uh, record-setting time right now, so you got to be careful when you're outside. Make sure you stay hydrated, you know, take shade when you can, and uh, just know your body and listen to what your body's telling you. If it's time to shut down and quit, shut down and quit, and don't... Uh, don't get yourself in any trouble in this heat wave that we've got going on right now. All right, we're going to get into the uh, meat of the matter here on the Kim Hammer Show, which incidentally, uh, I'll post things up to the KimHammerShow.com website if you want to go up there. Uh, in fact, I've got Dr. Ivy Pfeiffer with the uh, Department of Ed on the show today, and then I've got Dr. coming on after uh, Dr. Pfeiffer. I've got Dr. Yamamuchi. Yamamuchi. Yamaha Uchi. All right. He's going to get me straight before the show's over. All right. Well, anyway, he'll be coming on after we get done here with Dr. Dr. Pfeiffer. All right, Dr. Pfeiffer, this past week, and thank you for joining me on the Kim Hammer Show. This past week, you sent out the guidelines, and that's that's a key word, uh, guideline versus requirements uh, for the schools. And I'll get this posted up to the KimHammerShow.com website. But I wanted to have you talk through what the guidelines are and talk about some of the differences this year from last year, uh, this is like COVID wave two and wanted to look at these guidelines and give parents some idea of what is being sent out from the Department of Ed to their local school districts and um, just give them a, a comfort level. So thank you for joining me on the Kim Hammer Show. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm glad to be here. And um, we are um, pleased that um, we're able to start providing some information to help everyone start really thinking about going back to school. Um, I think all of us would agree that we were hoping the circumstances would be different this year, um, but we um, have worked closely with the Department of Health. Um, to update guidelines for schools. And um, what we really want to emphasize is that it's really time for schools to re-engage their community partners, their staff, their parents, um, and help everyone understand that um, they're going to be extending um, their, their plans that were in place as they ended the school year last year. Um, the plans are going to um, emphasize um, how we can have a safe reopening and continuity of services for the upcoming school year. Um, and I think really the, the most important thing we can do right now is to have clear communications. So that's really what the guidance is all about. And um, I'm happy to talk through some of the different um, components of the guidance. Do you kind of feel like deja vu or Groundhog Day? Um, here we are just coming right up on the opening of school. Last year, uh, we were dealing with some of the same issues. So let me ask you, what have you? What did you learn from the last go-around that you're applying to this go-around that's going to maybe help bend the curve down on it a little bit to the level that the Department of Ed has any control? That's a really good question. Um, I think what we learned is that um, that because of the strategic planning that was in place at the school district level and um, also at the state level and um, the, the constant communication that was going on between school districts um, and the Department of Health and the Department of Ed, I think we were able to understand the situation as it changed over time. <clears throat> we were able to understand where um, things were happening at times and, and learn from that and able to respond. Um, so what we're really doing is is going back and, and encouraging um, school districts to uh, continue those preventative measures that they had in place um, mm. last year. Um, we, we have learned uh, more about the benefits of increased ventilation. And so even simple things like opening windows in classrooms, having fans that help with that air circulation, air exchange, HEPA filters. So there are some, you know, some things that we may not have really focused on at the beginning of the year last year that we know um, can help. Uh, there are a lot of things that districts can continue. You know, one of the, um, one of the things that's probably hard for everyone to do is staying home when sick. And um, that's, that's hard for Students, they don't want to miss out on things. It's hard for teachers because they um, feel the obligation to be there with their students. Um, but those are things we want to continue. Um, 
physical distancing is, is not always possible in schools, uh, but, you know, we want to encourage districts to think about um, physical distancing, um, how they, uh, what procedures they might want to continue in terms of just um, um, not having as much congregation in hallways at the same time. Um, you know, we know that there's some activities that, that may have to be modified somewhat to, um, to just assist with not having as many people in one place at the same time. Um, the um, last year, their um, school districts did a really good job with um, initiating contact tracing processes and communicating with parents when um, there were exposures in schools. And we really were able to cut down on uh, the rate of within school spread. And um, really, we didn't have a whole lot of positive cases once um, some of those once those uh, close contacts had been identified and um, the, the resulting quarantines helped to cut down on that rate of transmission within schools. So I think all of those things together um, really helped us to have a successful school year. The And, and we're going to get into the list of um, um, guidelines that you gave out in a, in a minute. But let me ask you, the waiver, last time we were operating under emergency order of the governor, and I've used the term the, the guidance for the schools this year. But last year we were operating under the governor's emergency powers act this time around. We are not when it comes to the waivers that the schools had the benefit of last time that they don't have this time. Um, how is that impacting what the schools do? And are there things that, that could be done if the emergency powers act was reinstated that you as a department of ed cannot do because you don't have that authority. So last year there were um, there were several provisions in um, in law or rule that could be more easily waived um, than um, than we can do this year. Uh, for one, um, the start of school date was changed last year. Um, that's um, not something that can be done this year because the school start dates are set in statute. Um, last year we had districts that. Um, had a day, uh, maybe one day a week, where they had a virtual option for students, um, or maybe they had early dismissal. Um, those things, those are not things that can um, just be done um, because there's not a mechanism to waive that. What we have done instead this year is um, we have had several district that, districts that are um, going to continue to implement a digital program option, and so. They um, have really spent a lot of time in developing plans for a, a virtual program that would be, you know, students who are working remotely. So those um, those plans allow districts to ask for waivers, and um, because we know that um, a digital remote option looks different than a traditional school day. Um, I think it's important to note, though, that you know, we because we know so much more now about how to have school, we know so much more about how to respond uh, when there are issues that we really want to focus everyone on the fact that um, in-person learning is still very, very important. And um, COVID-19 disruptions really did rob students of the opportunity to, to be able to have that on-site learning. And so a lot of this is just trying to find that balance of um, being able to have students at school, knowing we're going to have to be flexible um, when um, positive cases do occur, but really keep the focus on how do we maximize the, uh, the opportunity for students and teachers to uh, be able to interact each day. Okay. And you're talking about distance learning. Uh, I think the test scores came out recently and um, what some people suspected as far as uh, the setback that we've had in the ability to educate our kids and now we're dealing with the you know the reaction to that or the the reality of that the the distance learning what specifically would you say that you've learned from that that could help make distance learning uh, pick it up a notch if that's a fair way to express it to where the kids that are utilizing distance learning uh, maybe don't have the lower test scores than those that are in the classroom or is there anything you can even do about that 
Sure. Well, and, and all districts learned so much last year um, because, um, you know, the the whole idea of um, the, the distance or digital learning remotely was really new. And so many teachers were trying to teach in person and students who were um, at home at the same time. And that is just an incredibly <laughs> difficult task. So, um I think every school district learned and the state board was very um, cautious in, in approving digital plans because they wanted to see, especially at the elementary level, that every student who was choosing a remote learning option would have interaction with a teacher. Um, and whether that interaction was every day or a few times a week, that there was always that adult who was helping to really monitor and check on that progress because we um, school districts really struggle with with keeping their virtual students engaged last year, and um, so so we've really learned that in order to have an effective virtual learning program, you've got to have steps in place to really keep connected and keep kids engaged. Um, there's still a lot of um, analysis that we need to do with our um, summative test scores. Um, you know, from from a state level perspective, we do know that our scores dropped and. Um, you know, particularly at the youngest grade levels where students had not had the experience with a um, summative assessment prior. So um, there's still a lot of things we're going to be digging in and learning, but um, we do feel more confident in our understanding of how um, important it is to have um, constant connection between teachers and students, whether they're in the classroom or they're at home, and also being able to um, let teachers dedicate their time maybe to um, the virtual learning aspect and not have, um, for the most part, teachers <clears throat> trying to do two jobs at once. Yeah, my, everybody knows, as if they're a regular listener, my wife is a public school educator, and that business of having the same teacher teach both in class and <clears throat> virtual uh, was certainly a challenge. I, th I think it was a huge adjustment for teachers to have to step into that role on the short notice that they were. <clears throat> Uh, do you find that schools, for the most part, are dedicating somebody that's going to be simply instructing virtually and the classroom teachers strictly teach in the classroom? Or is there a trend that is occurring among our school districts that show they're going one way strong or the other? For the most part, districts are dedicating time for teachers to um, instruct virtually and not um, not necessarily doing both at the same time. There may be a few schools where um, the way they had their plan structured, um, teachers might um, be, be playing a dual role. But what we've also been able to do is um, create a, an opportunity for um, teachers to attend or teachers to earn an online teaching endorsement. And that was done through one of our academies that started this summer. So teachers who are going to be doing uh, virtual teaching next year, um, and I don't remember the number of enrollees that we had, but I know we maxed out our capacity at uh, the different institutions that um, implemented this, but really focusing on um, helping teachers add an endorsement to their license to um, understand how the practices of online teaching do need to be different. So it, it was kind of that value add to their teacher license. It was great professional development. And they're going to be connected in cohorts through the upcoming school year as they finish that online degree. Okay. So uh, we think all of that together is really going to help um, help the, the whole virtual learning process. Um, we do have some districts that didn't apply for a virtual program. And so the window has been extended um, because we know that now there's a greater demand by parents um, just with concerns about um, the upcoming school year. Okay, I need to give I need to ask you a question um, that I was asked to ask you. Uh, given that some school districts have chosen to offer virtual options for older students but require in-person attendance for K6, the age group that hasn't been vaccinated, will ADA be giving those school districts the option to refill their virtual plans or encourage them to offer virtual to K-6 age children? Yes, they, they will have an option. We um, put out a memo last week uh, to explain the process. So um, districts need to <clears throat> notify us by next week if they plan to, re, um, to, to take advantage of that extended timeline. Um, 
they'll be able to um, begin the school year with um, an initial plan um, to start offering some um, a virtual program for students. And then um, by September, they will have to submit their complete plan and um, our state board will be looking at that. Okay. And, and approving those at that time. All right, so what I wanna do, uh, I wanna run through this uh, guides for school real quick and I'm gonna have it up on the kimhammershow.com website. You can go up there and take a look at it if you have questions about it. And let me just kind of run through some of the highlights. You give the opening comments, uh, you know, because many schools serve children under the age of 12 who are not eligible for vaccination at this time are not fully vaccinated. The guidance emphasizes implementing layered prevention strategies to protect people who are not fully vaccinated. You go through all those um, down to the first point, which is vaccinations. Um, and I'm going to read the bold print. It says fully vaccinated students or staff do not need to quarantine if deemed close contact unless they have developed symptoms. So that's new from last time around, isn't it? That is new. Um, you know, it wasn't until late spring that um, <coughs> children under 18 were eligible for a vaccination. So um, that is something that, that is new for students to be able to be vaccinated, but it's also an incentive uh, for both students and adults that um, if they are fully vaccinated, then um, the, quarantine the quarantine requirements are different from them unless they do have symptoms or they develop the symptoms. Okay. And then, uh, so the importance of getting vaccinated is if you get vaccinated and you do come into close contact with somebody, you're not going to have to be quarantined for two weeks, which would be huge to football players or sporting people, you know, people that are in the sports or anybody that's in the in the classroom ages 12 and up. Um, yeah, I, I definitely think it's it's an incentive. And then also just the realization that, you know, vaccines are um, the most effective strategy that we have to protect individuals. And um, we are encouraging districts to um, host informational sessions um, with the support of local medical professionals, partnering um, <clears throat> with um, their communities and, and helping to initiate vaccine campaigns um, for both students and staff. So let me give you this scenario because I'm thinking about some of my district. I think most districts are like this. You take the age 12 and under, they're going to be isolated to a particular building. They're not going to be commingling during the school day with those that are 12 and up that have been able to be vaccinated. If all the teachers in the building have been vaccinated and all the staff in the building has, they've been vaccinated. Um, as far as an outbreak in an elementary school, it would occur only if it came in with the student or somebody from outside the building came in and brought it and exposed the kids to it. Um, am I on track so far? So, you know, I, I think that that may be a more of a question um, for the medical professionals to answer. Um, you know, I do think that we can expect that um, that data are going to look different and, you know, between schools based on um, the ability of um, people to get vaccinated. You know, not every school configuration is the same. So it would be hard to say and pinpoint exactly where, um, you know, that, that you might see differences um, due to the rate of vaccinations. Um, sometimes, you know, 12-year-olds 12, 12 can be in, um, you might have some 12-year-olds, you know, in, in fifth grade, you might have some 12-year-olds in, in, you know, sixth or seventh grade, you know, so there's always going to be those variations. And um, that, that's really what makes every school district unique, every school building within a school district unique. Um, and so, you know, there are going to be times where it's going to be really hard to determine um, a vaccination stat status, um, you know, just based on who's in the building. What are you doing as a department and what are school districts allowed to do as far as uh, checking? I know like when we go in and out of the Capitol, if you got a temperature thing there, you got to check your temperature. Um, and I also know, you know, from working with educators that parents are going to drop their kids off if they're sick because they don't want to, you know, they want to go back home and sleep or they need to go to work and they can't really afford to miss a day of work. And you got to deal with that. What's the comfort that you can give from the guidelines that are being passed down by ADA to the schools that is providing some level of assurance that you're trying to screen the carriers of COVID at the door before they get out into the entire population of the school building? 
So um, we really are encouraging districts to continue um, to screen individuals who come into facilities or um, in cases where, um, you know, d during summer athletics um, screening their, uh, their athletes. We uh, heard of several um, instances last year where screening did um, um, catch people who didn't even realize that they were sick. Um, that, um, you know, so, so it was an effective tool. And um, we would encourage districts that had successful screening practices to continue that. You know, I know at times it can be inconvenient, but, um, you know, it is a um, it is one of those strategies as, as part of, you know, multiple prevention <laughs> methods that um, is still a good idea. OK, um, on the mask or face coverings, uh, you give some guidelines, which we know the hot topic right now is uh, act. 1002, I think, about the mandate being gone. So it does limit you as a school or school district uh, from mandating that masks are used. But you're giving out the guidelines, correct interpretation? Yes. Um, and and one of the things that, that we did do with the guidance is that, um, you know, just kind of like with the vaccines, uh, we're hoping that people would see that it could be an incentive um, to uh, wear um, a face covering because, you know, you don't always know um, what the status of, of people are. And as you said, you know, there are younger students who um, cannot be vaccinated. So uh, masks are encouraged. And um, one, of the, one of the ways to incentivize that is that if individuals are wearing masks and you have someone who is positive, and um, others who are exposed to that positive case, if both the positive individual and others are wearing masks, then um, the, the, those who are exposed would not have to quarantine if they were consistently and correctly wearing a mask. So um, masks are encouraged and, um, you know, and in, in, in as part of that, those layer prevention strategies, uh, they're, they're an important component of that. Okay, and I'm, I've got about two or three minutes left. I'm going to have to let you go, and I've got to shift to the second side of my program. Physical distancing, I know there were some changes. It says at least three feet of physical distance between students within the classroom and at least six feet between students and adults and between adults who are not fully vaccinated. You don't have any way to know who is or who isn't. Um, how is that enforceable in real application? And that's, that's something that each individual school uh, building um, has to deal with. Um, you know, in some cases, they um, have, have set up the classrooms or set up cafeterias and other places just to allow for that. Um, I think that's one of those things that's not an exact science, um, but uh, there were school districts last year that were able to, um, just by the very nature of how things were set up, there were consistent seating charts. There were um, um, just practices that were put in place that, that really helped to promote that and help them to be more comfortable with the fact that, you know, they were able to keep people spread out to the extent possible. Okay. I got like two minutes, so I'm going to give you the final question. Even when, even when COVID goes away and we get the numbers down to what people can sleep at night, are we ever going to see education be the same? Do we, are we going to go back to what we had or is it ever going to be the same as far as method of delivery? You know, I think that um, we've realized that, that technology can play an important role in um, enhancing educational opportunities. It can provide some flexibility and some, some added options um, for us. Um, my thought is I would hope that education is continuously getting better. Um, this has been one of the greatest challenges that, we've, that educators have faced in my career. And um, I think that with every challenge, we're also presented with the opportunity to learn, to grow, and to get better. So I would hope that education is going to constantly evolve, and we're going to learn, and we're going to get better. All right. You've been listening to Dr. Ivy Pfeiffer with the Department of Education here in Arkansas. I thank you for taking time to be out on the Kim Hammer Show today. And you go up to the website for the full list of guidance that was sent out to the schools this past week. And also, as they modify it and come up as we prepare for the start of school, I'll get it up on the KimHammerShow.com website. When we come back, 
we're going to have an interview with Dr. Yama Uchi. Did I get there close, doc, doctor? Perfect. Very good. Quit on a positive note. We'll be back after the break to the Kim Hammer Show. Welcome back to the Kim Hammer Show again. Hope you're having a great weekend. Also would caution you that with the uh, high temperatures out there, we're not maybe setting records, but we sure are bumping up against them. But regardless, anytime it's around 100 degrees in Arkansas, you got to be careful and just read your body well and make sure you stay well hydrated and uh, stay as cool as you possibly can. All right. On the second part of the Kim Hammer Show today, I have Dr. Yama Uchi who is a uh, guest and actually uh, Thursday morning was on the radio show. I was on with him and Dave uh, on the early morning show, got introduced to him, wanted to have him come back on the show. And uh, so let me, let me first of all ask you to give your uh, credentials, if you would, just in case somebody questions that I've <clears> got somebody on the Kim Hammer show that doesn't have the credentials to be here. So give us your background and your credentials and uh, tell us a little bit about you. Sure. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm kind of an old guy. I'm retired. I'm an MD, pediatrician, uh, and uh, specialized in infectious diseases. I, I was a member of the faculty at the University uh, of Arkansas. Uh, I got my training at the University of Oregon in uh, medicine and then did a fellowship or special training at UCLA in Los Angeles. Um, I'm a specialist in virology. Uh, that's where I did most of my training post post doctorate after my MD. I came to Arkansas. I was like in the uh, like there were ten of pediatricians, uh, and now we have over a hundred uh, just at the Children's Hospital. I was uh, head of infectious diseases at the Children's Hospital. Uh, I have taught at the CDC uh, in uh, Atlanta. I did at least 10 years there um, part-time. During the summer, I taught 10, uh, 10 hours of class or so. Um, and I've done a lot of training uh, of other individuals. Uh, I'm on the board of directors at the uh, health department. I was a former president there. I was a former uh, chairman of pediatrics at Children's Hospital and associate dean at the medical center. So I've had a lot of uh, experience uh, in, in the area of infectious diseases. So you're saying current with what's going on now? I mean, I know you're not practicing. You've got all that experience. You're, you're staying up to speed on what I, we're dealing I with today. I think so as much as possible. You know, there's a plethora of information out there, some of it good, some of it not so good. And trying to keep them separate or try to see which is which is uh, sometimes difficult. But I try to stay up with as much as I can and make decisions on what I've heard. So let me ask you, with your 10 years of teaching experience at the CDC, one of the things we as legislators get sometimes is mixed messaging because CDC sure. is quoted so much. Sure. And you know, it seems like depending on which way the wind's blowing, depends on what comes out of there. Yes. Tell us yes. about the CDC, about the structure of the CDC, and how is it that they could be regarded as an authority that some people quote and other people cuss? Well, so you're going to always find those people that cuss. Um, <clears throat> it, it's an organization with a lot of expertise. Sometimes it's almost too fine for the general practitioner or the public to understand. Um <clears throat> I um, I still look for it uh, as an authority. Uh, I think they've added people. You know, the former director of of the health department here in Arkansas is now there working in a leadership role. Uh, the head of pediatric, uh, head of uh, the health department now, Dr. Romero, uh, he still is a leader in immunizations. He's taught, he's been the uh, the 
I, I don't call him the president or the chairman. He's the chairman of the immunization for the whole country out of the CDC. So he's a very knowledgeable person and a very good uh, a teacher. Um, I do want to say one thing about uh, what I just heard from the education. You know, I, I think that uh, you heard the term immunize, immunization and people need, the children need to be immunized. Remember that we're not only talking about COVID. There are required immunizations for mumps, measles, uh, other diseases that uh, children need to have, and we mustn't forget that. Uh, actually, some of those vaccines are so important that uh, in many areas of the country, if the ch children have not been immune, immunized against mumps, measles, chicken pox, some of those, they are not allowed in school. So it's pretty serious. Uh, the other thing that I heard, and I, I did not hear, but I think we ought to uh, realize that the teachers are getting tremendous pressure, and they have enough you know, problems just trying to teach and to put some of these recommendations to the teachers uh, uh, is going to be even harder. And one resource that I'm very uh, fond of or active with has been the school nurses. And we didn't mention the school nurses as a resource to help uh, with uh, some of these health issues. So regarding... Um what you what you heard and let me let me go back to the point you just made as far as like the mumps um i, I don't want to guess your age but how close were you to when the mumps broke out or I, I'm, I'm trying to draw a comparison between what's the difference between the mumps when they broke out and the virus as it broke out today and the reaction to the population and the public was it the same back then? Not that you're old enough to go back that far, but with your studies, maybe you can. Was the reaction the same back then as it is today? <clears throat> and is it just a process we're going to have to work through? Or is there something different about the vaccine that justifies the reaction or have it different than when the mumps and everything, we had the smallpox and the other outbreaks? Yes. Well, I'm not old enough to remember I didn't think some, you were. Some of those things, but uh, I do will tell you that historically, uh, every time a new vaccine has been introduced, we have seen the same kind of panic or misinformation and fear uh, that we're seeing right now. Now, perhaps, perhaps to a large degree, the public is, excuse me, a little better informed about vaccines, uh, but uh, by the same token, communication says have been improved and more people are learning about vaccines. So you got, you know, half a dozen one, half a dozen another. Uh, so I would say that uh, because of mass communications, uh, um, we have more of a problem trying to educate the public. So if we had less mass communication, it'd be easier for people to be convinced. Well, or... may, maybe it depends on how it's used, of course. Okay. And you're, you know, I consider you an expert on communication, mass communications. Uh, uh, I, I don't know about legislators as a whole, but uh, you know, I think that the, the, your responsibility, you have a great responsibility there as well. For, excuse me, I just got a vision of the movie oh brother where art thou when the governor's walking up the radio station he said this is mass communication so i hope you weren't comparing me to him but anyway no but i you know i i think you got my my drift there um it's a huge responsibility that's facing us and i wished i had a better way to pass this on uh i have told the public that i'm willing to do this for anybody uh all groups um I don't make a uh, mandate as we hear now. I tell what I know, and as we heard from our other speaker this morning, uh, that um, individual choice is still my uh, preference. Preference. Do you? Uh... No, wait, let me just add one more thing. Uh, one of the things that we saw with measles in the past is it's a very, very communicable disease. That's one of the things. 
and it still kills if people that, that come down with it get it. So uh, it may be the seriousness of the disease or complications of the disease that uh, make it more important or more uh, uh, easily um, educated, educating the public. All right, so you're a pediatrician <clears throat> as an MD. Yes. Uh, and with a whole lot of other experience that with that, let me ask you, help us understand, it seemed like when the virus hit, when the virus first hit, it was targeting the older people, it was targeting... COVID, the, you're talking about COVID. COVID, yes, yes okay. I'm sorry, yep. I'm sorry. COVID, when COVID first hit, it was targeting the older people, that was the population that we were losing. Now, a year later, a year and a half later, it seems to be attacking the younger generation. And, and, and maybe I'm misinterpreting that. I know it's not a respect of age. It's going to get anybody it can. But why all of a sudden does it fall to the 12 and under group? Or is it just because more tension's being put on there? What's your interpretation well, of that? Well, all of that. Uh, I think that, you know, the, the older individuals that were being stricken with this the disease early uh, and remain the most uh, vulnerable have other underlying diseases or conditions, heart disease, pulmonary problems, uh, diabetes, immunodeficiencies. <clears throat> They're still the population that we worry about the most. Uh, and as we get those people immunized and educated, uh, the big group now are children. And how, how serious this will be in children remains to be seen. It doesn't look like children that contract this disease uh, have the same outcomes or serious outcomes that we see in the older individuals. The children that come down with us are also um, the ones that have the complications of other diseases, cystic fibrosis, pulmonary, other pulmonary problems, cancer, uh, diabetes, uh, congenital heart disease, uh, that, that type of situation. They're still the ones that are, we worry about, and they are vastly under immunized compared to our older population. Why does it, uh, you've got a vaccine that is taking care of the needs of the older, but that vaccine cannot be used in the 12 and under. Why can it not be used in the 12 and under, and what's the process for adjusting it down or developing it sure. that it's taking longer to do it? Yeah, first first let me point out that we are, we are not uh, <clears throat> taking care of our adult population yet. I still think we have a long ways to go on that. As far as children, we don't have the studies or the experience yet to say that this is uh, effective. Uh, my guess is it would be. But I don't know if there's side effects that children might have that from the vaccine that adults don't. And after we get a few more studies or more use in children, and what now I'm talking about the, the older <clears throat> child or the 12 years old up, uh, we, we should have some of that data. The flu, haven't heard anything about the flu and, I, you know, I, I question whether that's just it's not the popular item like it used to be because every year we heard about how many people, you know, died from flu. We actually dismissed school. You know, some schools dismissed because of the flu outbreak. Um, it has kind of gone to the side. Yeah. Remember, we it wasn't that long ago that uh, people that hadn't been immunized against the flu were told not to work or were uh, not given sick leave or were not given uh, uh, bonuses, et cetera. And I see some places now are looking at that in persons that haven't received the COVID vaccine. So, But we, but we are seeing some flu, uh, but not nearly as much as before. So in the past. step over in the uh, uh, maybe a little bit of the political side. Would you have an opinion as to whether or not that's because flu is not as hot a topic as COVID is. It's still out there. It's just That's not a, the uh, sexy, think, sexy I, headline. I think that, but, uh, you know, I, uh, I worry that if we don't get the flu vaccine, we'll have a bounce back of that disease. So, uh, yes, COVID's the sexy disease right now. Uh, 
uh, uh, but uh, flu is still there and uh, just not in the numbers. And we may be doing things like social distancing, the use of masks, uh, good hygiene, washing your hands, things like that that we're focusing on for COVID that are just as effective against flu. Okay. You brought the subject of masks. That's the hot topic right now. Yes. So a year and a half ago, sitting in committee meeting, I had asked Dr. Romero the question, not in a threatening way, just I wanted to know. It's back when the gator masks were becoming popular and it seemed to be, you know, the fashion statement accepted. We've got the gator mask, you got cloth masks, you got masks that have flags and, you know, all sorts of logos on them. You've got the typical um, dime store mask, you know, the medical mask. You got the N95 mask. When it first started, everybody had to have an N95. The problem with that was there wasn't enough supply to go around. Correct. Um, and so it was almost like, well, if you ain't got an N95, the second best are the cloth masks and, and all these other things. I distinctly remember him saying that those are not effective, and he went through this thing about the particles go through the cloth, and they're, they're not effective. So with your years of experience, what is your position or what is your opinion about the mask and how effective are they in preventing the spread of not even COVID, but what about other things like flu and, and other type of airborne diseases? Well, I think there is some effect, but I don't think there that's the answer. Uh, particles, of, especially if a mask is wet or uh, large no. droplets or, or uh, smaller particles of virus that goes through it very easy, go through any of those very easy. That's why you have saw for a while some people were saying, you wear two masks. Well, wear three masks, wear four masks, you know. Um, we do know that particles of the virus can pass through most of the material that is being used for, for uh, masks. Um, but I think that the main place I, I like masks is for education. You know, you see somebody wearing a mask and you say, oh, my goodness, that person has a disease I'm staying away from. Or the person that's wearing the mask say, you know, I'm wearing this mask not because I have a disease, but I don't want somebody else to give me a mask. Disease. So those are the reasons I see masks that having the most effect. People say, oh, I don't know if I want to go near that person. You know, I was on the elevator this morning coming up here, and there's a lady wearing a mask, and I said, thank you for wearing the mask. And she just she just nodded, and you know, there's another person that didn't say anything. So, you know, I, I think education is important re- with the mask. The if So you and I are sitting here. We're not masked. We're socially distanced. Um, I've been vaccinated. I presume you probably have been too. So we're pretty much in a, in a safe zone. So if I'm afraid of you because I see you unmasked, so I put a mask on, am I as safe in that as I am if you also had a mask on or will my mask be oh, sufficient? Wait. Now think about that for a minute. You know, that's what I'm at telling people. Use common sense and think if you're wearing a mask and I'm wearing a mask, that's probably safer than you wearing a mask and I'm not wearing a mask, or I'm wearing a mask and you're not wearing. A mask. I mean, I, it, it's like playing football. If you got a helmet on and I don't have a helmet on, that's common sense. Well, that's 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 right. That's right. And but when I see it, I say, hmm, that person is thinking, you know, <clears throat> or that person has something. Uh, so, you know, they're smarter. <laughs> but let me ask you: by the fact that I have a mask on, yes. And you don't. Yes. Am I protected from catching the virus from you because I'm wearing a mask? So it shouldn't make a difference whether you are or not. If well, I am and that mask is effective, okay, it should do its job or not. Yeah. Well, see, th- that's what makes these things so hard. You can always, you've been vaccinated, okay? There's a good chance you don't need that mask. But by wearing the mask, you're not going to get, and you're assuming I'm, going to have a virus or something you're assuming that my virus has come across there and they go through the mask and then your antibodies in your body fight it off that's what you're saying uh what i'm saying is that it's going to be less likely if it gets through the mask and gets into your body to cause you any problem okay if i'm wearing a mask it's going to be less likely to go through 
I mean, it'll go through it, but it'd be less likely to, in the numbers. That's okay. Uh, so it does give you some protection. Okay. The, uh, so let me, let me ask you this then with, I'll give you time there with, uh, with that bit of knowledge, if, if we were to take and draw a pie chart mm -hmm. and it's a hundred percent, what, what percentage of the pie and, and we want to defeat COVID, what percentage of the pie chart would be taken up by mask? What percent would be taken up by vaccination? What percent would be taken up by hand washing? You know, kind of range it in order as far as what's going to be the biggest thing to knock it back. See, that's another question. It's impossible to give a put numbers on. I think you heard me talking earlier about uh, statistics and numbers. I, you can make those numbers up for anything. Uh, I think if you use all of them, you're, you're much. It's much better. I mean, good hygiene, good vaccine, good. Uh, masking, you know, uh, talking carefully, not sneezing, turning your head, shaking hands, sh shaking hands. Right. We, I, when this was back in the flu, I was going around teaching children in schools, the Yama Uchi bump, which was elbows and uh, chamber of commerce. I did the same thing. Uh, and people still remember that, you know, I got people in. So you're responsible. Yeah, that's what okay. they call, call it, the Yamauchi <laughs> bump, you know. Except in the kids, some of them got a little rambunctious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, again, I can't put I can't put a number on those, unfortunately. I think it's better for, uh, if you use all of them, as far as protection. Now, I'm, I'm not sure I understood when you say what portion of the pie. Well, like, if it's 100%. The mask is 5%. The vaccine is 45%. You know, you want to have a complete attack plan. Uh -huh. And what percentage of the attack plan of that pie chart is taken up by mask? What percent is taken up by vaccinations? And see what masks? What, how many vaccine, vaccinations? Yeah, if we're going to mandate masks, should we mandate what kind of mask? If well, you're, you're going to go that route. There's, that's, all the, that's where the problems come in, you know. I mean, which oh. mask are we going to mandate? Okay. Okay. I, I mean, you see the problem. That's I that's know you stimulated uh, some thoughts today. Well, but but see, I get asked that kind of questions, and I can't give you a straight answer. I can say a, a mask is probably better than no mask if a person actually has a virus, or they're in a po population where the virus is in circulation. But I can't tell you that the the surgical mask is better better than. The, N95. The N95 is probably the best of the commonly used now uh, mask, but it's not 100%. We don't see it used 100% of the time. And those that use it, that's not 100%, but it's better than the cloth mask or the uh, the surgical mask. I, I've, we've got to, uh, I got to start putting the plan on the ground, but I want to ask you one question. I need your answer in two, two minutes or less. Okay. I'm a, I'm a uh, legislator. I've got a, maybe a hundred different viewpoints. Sure. And even the scientists don't even agree. Even the doctors don't agree. I know doctors, Dr. Jensen up in Michigan that I've had on the show before, you know, he's been blackballed because yep. he's been contrary to what the CDC, which doctor and which scientists are we supposed to believe when the professions themselves don't even agree on the same subject? And therein lies the problem. We have no one organization. I said earlier that uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics has come off now as opposed to what the CDC says. Which organization? I'm a pediatrician. I listen to the American Academy of Pediatric Pediatrics. I'm an infectious disease guy. I listen to the CDC. So I'm in a dilemma. And what I'm asking or what I'm telling people is that, you know, I have more training than the average Joe on the street, but I'm confused sometimes. And I want people to try to think about this and, you know, to make the best decision they can with what they know. 
so that they feel like they've made a decision themselves. They can go with the CDC or they can go with it. Okay, 30 seconds because you stimulate a question. What happens if we mandate the wrong thing, if the professions can't agree among themselves and we end up as a legislative branch mandating the wrong thing and we find out later that what we mandated was actually detrimental because people are learning so much about this as we go? Then we change. It happens every day. We've already seen that the CDC has changed what they said you know, a few weeks ago. Which makes it hard to mandate something when there's no consistency uh-huh. for a period. Any way I can. Well, I tell you what, your wealth of information, and I appreciate the the conversation. Be better educated for it. I hope so. Thank you. All right, you've been listening to the Kim Hammer Show. We had on earlier Dr. Ivy Pfeiffer with the Department of Ed talking about the new guidelines. You can go up to my website, thekimhammershow.com, in order to get that list of uh, guidance, not regulations, but guidance that has been given. And then secondly, we had on Dr. Yama Uchi. And um, thank you for coming on, doctor. And thank you for your years in the medical experience that you had. We hope that you have a great rest of the day. Remember, be careful. Plenty of water. Cool. Don't overexert yourself. The ERs can't handle any more folks. So don't contribute to the problem. Be smart. This is Kim Hammer and the Kim Hammer Show. Thank you.